I also have something to go to Slideshow with. Okay, so first can I begin by thanking the organisers for inviting me to speak. Um, it's a great privilege for me to speak uh, today on the future research of the Highlands, an area that, as um, <coughs> Joe says, is very close to my heart. Uh, like I was going to say, the two other speakers, like Alison did, uh, I want to cover a number of ideas uh, building on the excellent work from Alison, who so eloquently outlined the main issues concerning the preceding periods. So I'm going to be talking about the Iron Age, and I'll be following the SCARF definition, which is 800 BC to AD 500. We have to start, of course, by setting a few parameters, none more so important than our area of study. We are, of course, focusing on the Highlands. That is the modern boundary of Highland Council. Highland Council, as you know, is the largest local government area of the UK, as defined on this map. And of course, as we've heard today, the Highlands share borders with noteworthy neighbours, Aberdeenshire, Argyll and Butte, Murray and Perth and Kinross. And of course, look across the waters to or uh, Outer Hebrides and Orkney. So it's important to highlight the start of the lecture what I'm not going to be talking about today. Um, you won't be hearing about anything about Fraser Harper's Doug, um, the Cairnbrocks in Orkney, County Caves, Clarky Hill or Burnley. Exceptional sites, uh, and of course be ludicrous not to refer to our new neighbour work as Alison's done when creating Highland Scarf. But for today, I appreciate that I'm not going to be talking about these. Um, I'm purely going to be talking about um, bits and that loop. So, a bit like Alison and Trevor, the remit was these three questions. What is our current state of knowledge for Iron Age Highlands? How does it really relate back to the 2012 National Iron Age Scarf Agenda? And what more do we need to do going forward, and what are the key objectives? So I'm going to be looking back, and I'm going to be looking forward um, as well. So a bit like Alison, I want to set the scene by winding back to September 2012, when the Iron Age Scotland Scarf Panel Report was published. This is, after all, the basis of why we are here today and the next three years. So the panel's remit for SCARF 2012, which I guess is similar to ours, was outlined in an executive summary uh, on page 2 of the 184-page document. I'm sure many of you have read the executive summary. I'm sure many of you have read it on, I have to say. Uh, that, in a nutshell, was what we're trying to do. This all seems fairly clear. The main aims are to critically review the current state of knowledge and identify the gaps. So, given SCARF was written only a few years ago, it's reasonable to try and get a sense of the relevance of the Highlands to the Iron Age. How did the Highlands fare in the 184-page document? What was the current state of knowledge some five years ago? The answer is not much. Highland archaeology doesn't actually really rate a mention. Don't believe me? Have a look at the map. These are some of the key sites. If you can make them out, half of them that are in the Highland region are like June 12. Doing trodden, sites excavated in native oak cake. So, it's not exactly a massive uh, basis to start. And this gets told when you consider the bibliography. Usually, a very good, good guide to the key sites, texts, and ideas in any academic work. Of the 900 or so references quoted, less than 20, or less than 3%, relate, relate directly to our Highland Scarf region. So we're like Caroline had this person with hardly any fingers and thumbs for sites, much the same for the actual references. Now of course with this meagre total, three were antiquarian articles published in the late 19th century by people like this guy Joseph Anderson, and another six were related to work in the immediate post-war period. And the remaining were written by a handful of others over the last 50 years. Only two were actually published in the last decade. Or to put it another way, only 0.2% of the published bibliographic references in Iron Age Scarf 2012 relate to what we would call, arguably call current state of knowledge. <coughs> but this is no way a criticism of the authors. Anyone who knows anything about the Scottish Iron Age knows that the bibliography in Scarf 2012 is absolutely right. It is an accurate reflection of our discipline, with the simple fact that many excellent endeavours taking place in the last 30 years were in the areas out with the Highlands. 
We can, of course, only marvel at the wonderful work constantly and continuously undertaken in Orkney, Shetland, and the Outer Hebrides that have quite literally reshaped the research agendas of Atlantic Scotland and beyond. And our inferiority complex is only exacerbated by more near neighbour analysis to the east, with the exceptionally important work done by many, including, of course, uh, the National Museum and Fraser. SCAF 2012, therefore, paints a dispiriting review for the Highlands. She has little or nothing to offer wider discussions. Must be finished. Thank you. <laughs> But if we look at the years before and after SCARF, a new sense of optimism emerges. During this decade, there has been a huge amount of important research undertaken in the Highlands, and some, I would argue, which will be central for unlocking many of the key narratives and themes identified in Irony's SCARF. If we were to rewrite SCARF in, say, three years' time, when numerous sites I'm going to mention are published, then I strongly argue that the Highlands would be central to our discussions of the Iron Age. Thus, we are in exciting times. The timing of this regional framework is perfect for the Iron Age, a time to reflect on recent work and draw together some conclusions that will inform future narratives and methodologies. So as a way of kick-starting this three-year debate, I want to reflect on some key areas identified in SCARF in 2012 and show how some recent work and critical Highland projects fit perfectly into these wider narratives. Now, with time remaining, I cannot possibly do the recent research uh, justice, so I've only chosen six sites. And I've chosen them because I think they have wider relevance, not just for the site types, but for some key questions that are identified in SCARF. I simply don't have time to talk about every recent site, so apologies to the excavators and helpers, such as the Wee Digs Project, Frumster Brock, Swartagale and Caveness, Fiskevave Cave, and many others. I should also say, because we're getting filmed, that all that follows is unpublished data. I've called in some favours, therefore I'm extremely grateful to a host of colleagues and friends who have kindly given me their ongoing research data and pictures for this lecture, particularly Steve Birch, Ross Murray, Candy Haverley, Graham Kamers, Gordon Slight, Matt Ritchie, Mark Cook and John Barber. So I'm going to give you an overview of the sites, highlight some of the key points and at the end draw back into the SCARF objectives. Let's begin with a site that needs no introduction, High Pasture Cave, a site meticulously and expertly excavated and directed by Steve Birch. Three key points to note about High Pasture Cave. First, the clear importance of moving away from our core study sites, that is, upstanding domestic architecture. Everybody, myself included, who studies the Iron Age of rushes to the Brocks and things like that, but these sites show that we need to move away from that. Seldom are narratives based on non-domestic sites like caves, but Steve's work has clearly shown that caves may have been a place for gatherings, for exchange, for the negotiation of status, and for the forging of new social relationships and identities. Further, Steve's work has demonstrated the need to investigate the wider environment and landscape around the cave. The e economic use of caves did not take place in a vacuum, and their use most likely articulated with activities and use of other types of structures at the surface including settlements, and this will all come out in the High Pasture Cave publication. Second, the vast environmental and artefactual evidence recovered is quite breathtaking. In particular, the range of activities show how much we can learn about different crafts, metalworking, agricultural practices, exploitation of wild resources, feasting, and the deposition of human remains. Third, the depth and quality of the, ar of the archaeological evidence makes it central to any understanding of Iron Age ritual practices and cosmology. In particular, the overwhelming evidence for structure deposition challenges many preconceived ideas regarding the functions of sites and particularly caves in the British Isles. Further, the human remains are not suggestive of a single normative funerary rite. Instead, these bones appear to represent the material residues of various mortuary practices carried out over a period of around eight centuries. Absolutely stunning stuff. <coughs> Our second key site, of course, is Kilduthal, mentioned a numerous times before. Again, I'm very grateful to Headland for giving me this. This is just the way he published. I've got these from the proofs. Um, and again, I want to pick up on three points. 
17 timber roundhouses were recognised. Many of these were workshops used between the 2nd century BC and the 2nd century AD. Iron, bronze and glass objects were manufactured, manufactured within furnaces and hearths, all located in situ, very rare, within areas of preserved Iron Age ground surfaces, alongside craft working tools, working waste and assemblage of grass, glass, bronze and iron objects. The sheer quantities of iron slag, for example, recovered indicate that Kolduthal was a significant production centre for ironworking in the region, while the ironwork recovered is the largest Iron Age iron assemblage ever identified in Scotland. The Crucible of Moe fragments is the largest assemblage of its kind ever recorded in Iron Age Northern Britain. And the glasswork in Debbie and glass is the first secure evidence of Iron Age glass working from any Scottish site. So in Kilduffo, you've got iron working, glass working, non ferrous metal working, all in the same workshops, all in the same area, and they're making it all, okay? Incredibly rare. You're very lucky to find one of these evidence, let alone them all together. The second key point about Kilduffo is the wide range of Roman goods recovered, included imported raw materials for the craft industry, they're using bits of glass, reusing the metal for their craft, but also, of course, finished luxury goods for personal adornment and feasting. And this clearly uh, alludes to extensive contact with the Roman world. Probably not that surprising given the burning and all that kind of stuff down, but incredibly important around about the area where we are today. And the third key point is networks of communication and contact must have existed to maintain the scale of specialist production and Roman finds. The Roman objects clearly indicate that this wealthy community had sources of opportunity to acquire exotic and prestigious goods. Acquiring these goods may have happened over a considerable period of time, part of a common Roman policy of securing peace along the frontier probably. Thus, Kolduffel was a major, if not the major, production centre, with networks of long distance contact and trade, and was undoubtedly a power base for an influential and prestigious community. It is quite simply one of the most significant Iron Age roundhouse and craft working sites excavated in mainland Scotland in the last 20 years. Just for us at the site from North West Scotland. <laughs> the Bible Wind Tour, my third site is Clackdale Brock, an absolutely amazing project. Spearheaded by Gordon Slate, historic asset, and again, three very quick points. Um, this was just excavated last year. We're in the process of uh, writing up all the things. And so I'll give you a quick general overview. Um, well, first it fell down. Okay. Just think of all the stone in the effort, and you know, these guys' ambition was to make this, um, not just research, but a heritage community asset. So that's what it started looking like. And after a huge amount of work and removal of the rubble, basically they un un uncovered a preserved Iron Age floor. Okay, so it's fell down on top of it. Not quite a Pompeii effect, but we get there. And of course, the collapse preserved an incredible amount and range of ecofacts and artifacts that quite literally give us a glimpse into the house of a typical Iron Age family, probably about 300 BC. A wealth of remains were uncovered, including pottery, lamps, worlds, textile working, of course, weaving combs, loads of querns, structure deposition, of course. And importantly, a really good assemblage of iron objects. Um, we've talked about the Iron Age, that we think the Iron Age doesn't exist, though it's somehow controlled by the Romans, but here we have a snapshot of time that's got a lot of iron objects. So perhaps iron may have been more widespread than we thought. The iron objects included axe heads, blades and, and reaping hooks. Now the collapse of course allowed not only the artifacts to be found but a rare glimpse into how an Iron Age house may have been structured with finds recovered from discrete areas from within the brock. For example, the majority of metal objects came from the southeast area, perhaps suggesting this area may have contained a storage area for iron tools. In contrast, the dem demonstrably personal objects, including combs and pins, came from the western half of the brook, 
perhaps suggesting that the beds may have been an area more routinely occupied as a living space. And the northeast area was lacking in domestic comparable finds, but we found a knocking stone and incredibly high concentrations of carbonised grain. So basically this knocking stone, you burn your grain and then you knock it out before you start using it. Uh, sorry, it's not burnt, you knock it out and then use it. The fact it's burnt and it's in situ clearly shows it was burnt down and it fell down. Okay, we just leave that lying around. So perhaps there's even discrete areas for cereal production. Now Iron Age archaeology since the 80s, since Parker Pearson that have been looking for structure deposition and cosmology and different areas, but we've never found a site that actually tested any of these theories. There is. Fourth key site is the Brock village at Leinster um, in Caithness. Again, three key points. First one is probably not a Brock or a Brock village. Um, there's no structural evidence to suggest the Brock is Brock, it might be a simple Atlantic Grounds house. Um, and also the buildings around it, which are sometimes called Pictish or not, they actually date to the 2nd century AD. Um, so there's a village, but it's not a broad village. Um, so it completely goes against what we normally think of Irish structures. So again, the site shows that we need to be open to new dating, new interpretations of those sites we've pr previously classified. Second, the range of artefacts, including Roman finds and non-ferrous metalworking, suggest again the site was of some status. And given the proximity to other sites, so there's Bronx, there's Bronx villages, the symbol of that roundhouses, there's promontory forts. This area here is still a, a wonderful candidate as a landscape study to start unpicking social structures in the Iron Age. Third is a, maybe a precursor for uh, Gordon. Uh, we think the site was probably reused later uh, for uh, Pictus burials, the burial on, on your life. Is very similar to the ones they find at Akagil, sort of stacked burials. Um, and we think this suggests the site was of still some importance to the locals many years after the Iron Age village was abandoned. And there's plenty of examples, it's just down the road um, Akagil, Burkle Hills. Um, so we're thinking it's maybe these areas are somehow venerated in the later period, it's just not a happenstance reuse of a mine. So this idea of a continual use of the landscape, not just a site. Our fifth key site is Whitegate, just down the road from Leinster. Again, it's probably not a brock. It's probably a simple Atlantic roundhouse. For those who don't know, that's something before a brock. You think? <laughs> um, so the key point is, there's a massive amount of different types of structures hidden within this plethora of catch-all brocks in the highlands. Um, there's a far more new and strange sites there. Second, the site location was clearly important on a ritual basis, both before and after the roundhouse. Before it was built, this well was built. We couldn't get any dates for this, but other parallels maybe suggest this is Bronze Age or early um, Iron Age in date. And then 1,000 years later, a range of human uh, bone and animal bones were buried in the walls, presumably after the building was abandoned or nearing the end of its life. And this is quite a common theme now being drawn out by people like Ian Arba and um, Alison and the radio carbon dating from old human remains. Um, so we came to dig a brook, we didn't find one, but we left with a well and human remains. So entirely unexpected what we were looking for. The final site, just to give you an idea of a different site, of course, is the Rich Five Fort at Dundirdo, which many of you excavated on, a wonderful project championed by Matt Ritchie and the Nevis Landscape Partnership. Again, two key points. First, the recent work demonstrated a good dating sequence for the burning of the fort. It's about 350 BC, not Pictish, as some think. Second, and this is quite important for methodolog uh, methodology, a programme of coring took place out of the monument, demonstrated the dating of burning activities in and around the area. And we got a date from the core which is absolutely identical to the date that we actually got from the trenches over the vitrified fort. So perhaps we can soon date episodes of burning of vitrified forts without actually dating the monument. An interesting methodology perhaps for sites, particularly those that are scheduled. So with these new sites and many others in mind, let's return to SCARF 2012 Executive Summary. 
The main recommendations for future research were summarised under a number of headings, some here, and a number of uh, subheadings. So I'm going to show you two awful tables. You don't really have to know the facts, but basically, building blocks is one of the key points, and then it has some bits underneath it. And I've just put high pasture cave, cold duffel, collectel, lifester, white gate, etc. And shown if you analyse it now, it did scarf now. You can probably answer most of these questions from the recent work. Okay, so there's no point in an iron age scarf with them. What's <laughs> two on the ground? So things like chronological control, undoubtedly, Kilduffel and Clark Toll have aided that enormously. Beginning to find new settlement types, all of them have done that. How to understand the house use, Clark Toll was probably without many black lock down the Cranham site. Those are the two best examples you're going to get. Material culture, Alison rightly lauded the material culture side of it. There's a whole new iron object, that whole thing coming out. Um, subsistence practices, ritual practices, we're still not very good at landscapes beyond the settlement, but I'll, I'll come back to that. But really importantly, Scarf identified the, the horrible wider context, the big questions that they called in an executive summary. The introduction of iron, the relationships with the Roman world, etc. I would argue that probably, with the exception of Hillforts, we've got a really good data set now to start asking these uh, questions. So maybe the Highlands can start feeding into wider British, European, Iron Age things, not the other way around. So once all these sites are published and digested, then I think we're a long way from the dispiriting view of the Highland Iron Age portrayed five years ago in SCARF 2012. Indeed, I would say, I would argue that this recent work, collectively and individually, has added a huge amount to our understandings of the British, if not European Iron Age. Can you actually think of many other sites where the preservation is as good as High Pasture Cave, Kilduffel and Clack Toll? I'm certainly struggling. We were a resounding foundation on which to build the Scarf Iron Age for the, uh, the Highlands, and actually Scotland. So in a space of about 10 years, the bridesmaid has turned into the bride. So, what is still to be done? Are we really only settling for one high pasture cave? Or one clack toll? Are these sites actually an exception to the rule or the norm? I guess we won't know until we find another one. And what will we do we find another one? Does another Kilduffel or High Pasture Cave or Clack Toll diminish the value of these unique sites? Alison and I used to ask this question of Fraser that if you find one room in five, it's, it's wonderful, and then you find another one down the road, and then another one. Does that diminish them all? Or does that make them all wonderful? But of course, these are questions for the future. My personal view would be be content with these exceptional sites and accept these are going to be the site types for a generation, so perhaps it's best concentrate our efforts on other areas and other key SCARF objectives that we still don't understand. Let High Pasture Cave, Clacktoll and Kilduffel be the start. Let's now fill in the gaps. I think we should concentrate on more landscape studies. I tried to start this in Cave Ness. Um, there are wonderful areas across the Highlands that you have different site types. They can allow you to unpick chronology. It doesn't have to be expensive. They're out there. I think we need to go and do them. That's the only way you're going to understand change through time and landscape. Hill forts. There's loads of hill forts in the Highlands. We don't know very much about them. Dundirdle's a great start. There's plenty of others. But my view would be approach with caution. If you speak to people like Strat Halliday, he's an adamant. That if you're going to do it, do a date break, which in the 1970s would be digging a large area, a large area of ramparts. Key old trench can give you some information, but if you really want to understand what Hillforce did, you're going to have to bite the bullet and dig a lot of it. Of course, a lot of these are scheduled, so there's an interesting discussion to be had there. But if you want to understand the Hillfort, you need to go dig it. And again, a bit like what Simon Gilmore and others um, championed, uh, the non brock sites are critical. We need more excavations of dunes, simple Atlantic roundhouses, roundhouses like the Wee Digs, did so brilliantly well, Anna's Selness, great booklet, summary of her work. Four pound, Anna? That's right. Brilliant. <laughs> so Brooks will always dominate the discussions, I think, but we need a far wider understanding of the non-monumental sites. As I say, such excellent work has happened in the West and I was a people like Simon were deliberately choosing sites that were Brooks. You dig them, you date them, you get a whole different idea of Iron Age landscape. And of 
quick note on methodology. One thing I've learned from working on roundhouses and hill forts is that you simply have to dig the walls. If you think of how many sites of rocks have been excavated in the last 50 years, most people don't even touch the walls, they dig the inside. This, uh, John Barber is talking at the Rhine Lectures in three weeks, he's going to bore everybody about this here. Uh, from Sir Brock, we dug the walls, the complexity within these walls is staggering. They're not monolithic monuments, they fall down and rebuilt. We just treat them as one whole thing, built at one point, that's that done. It's not nowhere near like that. And if it's that amount of complexity of the walls, how are you going to understand the interior deposits? So, if you're going to do it, dig the walls, which again leads to a methodological problem, perhaps, to shed the monuments and the wind. I'm still also a firm believer in returning. Oh, sorry, digging the walls, no. Um, people may ask, where's the prayer of dead people, perhaps in the Bronze Age? Um, Dean Arnott's done a wonderful series of uh, papers and studies along with um, people like Alison. They basically either burn them under the walls, they put them in walls, mainly skills, um, and that's often if you only find them if you're actually digging out the walls. The same at meat, the same at thrumster, the same at limestone. I'm still a firm believer in returning to an antiquarian period. I doubt many people in here would have the vision and stamina to commit to digging a new untouched rock, as the wonderful people in Historic Ascent did. And if they did, fair play to them. But perhaps it's equally easier to go back and have a look at the old sites first excavated by antiquarians like Anderson, Wright, and Jose. Yes, much of the archaeology has been compromised, but there are undoubtedly pockets of information that can be gleaned fairly cheaply and fairly quickly. And now Chestnut, Serendipity. The discovery of Colduffo from a single crop mark of an isolated palisade of little consequence is a salutary warning to archaeologists not to dismiss seemingly insignificant sites. Enclosed settlements and palisade enclosures dominate the landscape of the north, and to understand the social and political geography of the region and its place within the Iron Age world, further intrusive work will be required both on the seemingly prestigious sites and those that appear on the surface to be far less remarkable. Nobody would have thought you would have found that in And of course, as Alison says, chronology <coughs> is absolutely key. Secure, well-dated evidence is absolutely essential. And we need more science, lots of it. We need more dates, lots of them. Otherwise, all the other narratives collapse. <coughs> so to conclude, um, Susan asked me to end by throwing some musings out to the audience. She said be confront confrontational, so I will be. Um, so I want to end with some three key points that we can perhaps discuss later or in the, in the months and years to come. A point first related, um, ideally, um, back to the gentleman at the back. The first is to pause and ask, can we actually answer everything? I might be being thick. But there are some agendas and scarf that I simply fail to see how you can actually answer with a trout. How do you collect evidence to answer these questions? I'm probably getting old, so I'll get fat, but I think literature these days often asks great questions without thinking, how do you actually answer that through archaeology? Surely research questions should be associated with testable methodological statements, not just nice words. Let's focus on the things we can answer with the data, not the things we'll pretend to do. From my own personal view, not just for Highland, but also for Scarf in general, what's going to happen with it? Is it a research tool for universities? A three-year project to sit on the shelf? A project to try to get people interested? Is it a planning and development tool? Regards to the there are models in England, such as Herds for HS2, that are reinvigorating methodologies for developer-led archaeology, and ones that are more geared to research and new questions. I am absolutely certain involving the Highland Council Archaeology Department is absolutely critical to any future SCARF model. These guys, well, two of them, are under-resourced, underplayed, and underappreciated, but they should be central to discussions, as they know the archaeology better than anyone else. And my final point is this, this should be a star for all, a project to be totally inclusive of all parties, private, public and third sector, both during the design and the delivery. Such large scale research projects are an important element in developing new approaches to the Iron Age. Now I 
simply do not doubt the importance of long-running research excavations. But I read this often as a subtext that the development and implementation of ideas is largely linked to a chosen few, often in a few institutions. But this is simply not a world I recognise. We have seen over the last decade stimulus for cutting-edge research in the Highlands has come from one guy interested in potholing, a number of incredibly ambitious and visionary community groups who wanted to undertake work to stimulate local, education, economic and social benefits, a thoroughly professional commercial archaeology company undertaking a development-led project in advance of housing development, and an ad hoc collection of misfits who wanted to revisit the battered remains of an antiquarian past in Cave and S. Universities and museums have an absolutely critical role to play, but in my experience it's people like Gordon Slate, Matt Ritchie and Steve Birch who are the main drivers of cutting-edge research at the Highlands. Every scrap of research is important, no matter who creates it, and it's our job now to be aware of it, celebrate it and tie it together. So I very much look forward to the next three years of more breathtaking Highland Iron Age archaeology, stimulated by a variety of committed people from the public, private and third sectors. And more power to you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>